The Search for Planet X. In this game, the players take on the role of scientists or teams of scientists and they're looking for, well, Planet X, a planet that might or might not be somewhere in the solar system. Its present may explain some anomalies about stuff that happens. I know I'm getting a little technical here, but that's how I understand the science, so that is how I convey it. And actually, from the point of view of science, the game portrays some processes of actual science. So, for example, your conferences where people People will learn a lot or you have a peer review people submit papers with hypotheses and after a while because peer review takes time they find out uh, well how well received their hypotheses are and whether or not they're actually true the game is app enhanced you will need at least a phone on which you can download a free companion app and basically the app will generate a sky with different objects in the sectors of the board. What you see on this side is the standard game that has 12 sectors. On the other side of the board, you have 18 sectors. Each sector has one object with the exception of two sectors that are truly empty. It's important to distinguish the truly empty from the not so empty because one sector has planet X, but the sector appears empty. So there are three sectors that appear empty, two actually are, and one uh, contains planet X. In this game, you will score points for figuring out uh, the objects that are in the different sectors. You, figure, you score a lot of points and you trigger at the end of the game if you find where planet X is and what are the objects in the two sectors next to planet X. And that's pretty much is the general idea, the general gist. Now, each player will have a screen behind which they hide their personal sheet that they will use to take notes and also to cross out things, to eliminate things, uh, so to get progressively a sense of where the fabled planet X might be. Each player also has a set of tokens that are used to submit papers to journals waiting for peer review and two target tokens to perform the target action that we will describe that can be performed only twice per game. You need to spend a token every time. So you start a new game. You select if you want it to a standard or expert and we start a new game. We get the funny sounds. This code is important because you can play with just one phone and you pass it around or you can have multiple players. Once you start a game and you generate a code, the other players click on the app in join a game instead of starting one. They insert this code here and now everybody has access to the same sky, to the same information on their phone. Very convenient. Uh, this is simply to determine the orientation of uh, the board uh, based on where we're sitting. There you go. And now this is also interesting. You determine the level of difficulty that you want to play at based on the number of clues that you have originally, uh, initially. That means that actually each player can have a different set of initial clues, which also means that each player can play at different levels of difficulty. This is a game that you can play with your children and actually have a honest level of challenge because you're going to give 12 clues to your kids and for yourself you're going to give 4 clues to yourself or none. And actually, you're playing the game, and both you and your children are playing the game, which is adequate to their cap to their capabilities. And so, uh, it's, I really like that that it's a game that each player can play at a different level. We're gonna uh, start experience because we are experienced players here. Secret information will give you the initial information. So, for example, I know now that in Sector 2, there is not a dwarf planet. So, I look at my sheet of paper, I look at Sector 2, and, and each sector here shows me the possible things. There may be Planet X, it may be truly empty, there may be a gas cloud, dwarf planet, meteor or asteroid field, or comet. Now, I know, remember, in Sector 2, there is not a dwarf planet, so I simply cross that out. Not dwarf planet planet. Yeah, you also need to have writing implements. Then I know that sector 3 does not have a glass cloud. I remove that also. Sector 5 also not a gas cloud. 
and sector 11 not an asteroid field there you go and so this is my initial setup and again different players will have different setups based on the level of difficulty before we continue we need to know something about the rules that regulate uh, that regulate the actions in the game so we now hear looking at the back of the player aid that there are two comets in the sky and comets may only be located in particular sectors basically they are in sectors with prime numbers as indicated here see three five seven and it goes to eleven on the other side it also goes to thirteen and seventeen <coughs> so comets don't have they don't, you don't have to scan every sector to figure out where the two comets are. Asteroids, there is always an asteroid field next to another one. Each has at least one asteroid field adjacent. No lonely asteroid fields. That means that either they're all four next to each other or there are two groups of two. So that still follows the rule that each is next to another one. There is one dwarf planet uh, that is not adjacent to planet X. There's important information because you can't really figure out uh, a truly empty sector from uh, an empty sector that has planet X, so you cannot figure it out directly, you have to figure it out indirectly. Another thing that helps you is the gas clouds, because each gas cloud is adjacent to at least one truly empty sector. So there's a sector that looks empty, you use these two things to determine if it really is. Again, there are truly empty sectors, and one with planet X, we are reminded, not adjacent to a dwarf planet, and appears empty in um, more most actions that you take. Now, we're talking about the actions. Here we have the board that shows the 12 sectors. We place a player tokens on this track that runs, runs around the board. The sky, only half of the sky is visible at any given time. So that is cool. You can just scan, you know, if the opposite side of the planet from where you are. This is a game where in uh, like in other games, so the player who is behind takes the next turn and it is possible to take multiple turns in a row. Basically, actions that you take will move your pawn on this track. Suppose I just took an action that moves me by four, one, two, three, four. Then is the red player's turn, and they take an action that only uh, costs one time. And the ne next action is three, one, two, three. When you reach an area with someone else, you go in front. So they also get to take a turn, and so on and so forth. So that's the idea that you've seen in other games also. But what are the actions that you're taking here? Possible actions are scan. When you scan, you select an object, say, booyah, dwarf planets. You select a range that is visible here. So right now we have sectors that are visible between 1 and 6. These are the sectors I can scan. And you choose a range there, say, 1 to 4. The scan action will tell me how many of that are there and so how much time it takes me. There are no dwarf planets in sectors 1 to 4. Alrighty, so I'm just gonna cross these out. One to four, no dwarf planets. That already helps. That's the scan action. Then we have the target action. Again, only twice per game, very expensive. But then you select a sector and the app will tell you. I might have a scope. Also known as the camera was fine. And the app will tell you what you find there. Say, I want to know what's in uh, sector 6. And I'll just... Know that. Oh, it appears empty. Uh, something you can do when something appears empty, a sector appears empty, is to cross out everything and to circle both planet X and the, sec the, sec the empty sector symbol because you don't know which one is which. In general, you cross things out to eliminate them and you circle them to indicate that you found them. The research action, it only costs one point or one time point but you cannot take it two turns in a row. After you take the research action, you need to take another action next turn. What happens is that with the research action, you choose one of these topics and you will learn a logic rule that 
uh, applies in this game. For example, this research tells me that all comets are within a range of five sectors or less. And I'll definitely want to make a note of that. You also will make a note of when you scan things, you make notes here. Uh, comets within five. Fascinating. Or maybe I wanted to do instead research to figure out about dwarf comets and gas clouds. They know that at least one comet is adjacent to a glass cloud. And I make a note of that too. Adjacent cloud. I'm making notes because maybe then I'll, I'll play the game solitaire. The game can be played solitaire. You just play until you find the planet. There. But when you play against other people, it's more fun. Now, uh, peer review, oh, at the end of the game, you can try to locate Planet X. If you do locate it, you have to identify the sector and what's in the two sectors next to it, and then you trigger the end of the game. Peer review and Planet X conferences. Now, uh, let's take a closer look. When a player takes a turn, if the sky symbol here, the sky template, is behind the last player, you rotate it until it reaches the last player, like so. So that changes the sectors that are available. However, as you do so, if the arrow encounters that symbol, then it's time for everybody to submit papers to peer review journals. To submit a paper, you choose one of those tokens that they showed you at the beginning, these ones, and you place it in a sector where you think uh, that may, may be the case, that that is what, what's there. And so, for example, I decide that to me, there's a chance that there's a comet in five. So I take one of my things here and I put it there. Other players, each player will place one there. After everybody's placed a paper or hypothesis token in the external square, of each sector, then all tokens on the board are moved by one, including the ones that you already placed. So that means that maybe there is one from a previous turn that was there and now is here, and one from a previous turn still that was here and now is there. When an hypothesis token reaches the last space, then is when the results of the peer review are coming in. Then you look at your fateful app, and I had placed my, my hypothesis here. Nine dwarf planet. I'm not telling people yet if my hypothesis is correct, but that was it. And the view results are oh, incorrect, sector nine. So I don't reveal that information. I simply make a note on my, on my uh, log that there is no dwarf planet in sector 9. Suppose that there was, then that means that my hypothesis was correct, the paper is published, now it's available to everybody, so I, I say that was correct, I reveal it to everybody, so everybody has that information, but that token stays there because it will score me points at the end of the game. And of course then players will not be able to place I put these tokens there once the object that has been identified has been revealed. So that's for the peer review process, as you move the template, at some point it will also reach this space here with a little X symbol and that's the Planet X conference. When our template reaches that space, then we have a conference. And to resolve that, we simply go back to our trusted, trusted companion app. And we'll learn about a rule that everybody learns about, because a conference, again, is public information. Planet X is within two sectors or less of a glass cl gas cloud. I often say glass cloud when I play this game, and my daughters make fun of me. This is the idea. This is the game. Once a player has found the Planet X and the two things next to it, they announce, I found it, but they don't announce yet what um, where that is. Also, trying to guess that cost you five clicks. Was that five or four? I don't know. I, let's assume it was five. People behind you then get that. There are no turns taken anymore, but people get a last chance to either try to identify Planet X or put down a last 
a last research token at the, or paper token. At that point, all the paper tokens that um, they were there are revealed. We look at the end game with the solution that tells us what is where. And that ends the game. The player that found Planet X will score 10 points. You score one point for each item that you correctly identified. That's why the tokens stay there. Then actually though, after that, the items don't all score the same because I'm um, identifying a comet will give you three points. You score four points for each gas cloud. More than one player may score points for identifying Planet X and how many points you score is based on how many spaces you are, you are behind the, the first player to identify. If you identify this player just identified where Planet X was after this player triggered the end of the game. One, two, three. One, two, three. This player has scored six points. That means if you figure it out when you're five, score, five uh, spaces behind, you score just as much as the first player. So finding Planet X means that for sure you trigger the game and there are good chances that you will score more than other people for that task. But no certainty. And this is how you play the search for Planet X. Funny the kind of coincidences that happen when you play a lot of different games. Just recently I played The Crew, The Quest for Planet Nine, which has been a big hit with my family. And I just so happened to play another game with a very similar topic. Now you're searching for Planet X, which also is a huge hit in my family. Uh, that's almost like the Arnaldo's new obsession, at least for me and my daughters. We haven't tried with mom yet. I think she may like it because she's a scientist, so uh, she may like this. <clears throat> and even as, although my specialization as an academic is in the humanities, of course, the same uh, passages of the scientific uh, process apply to the hard sciences and to the humanities, because peer review works the same way in the sciences as it was in the humanities. You send a paper to a journal and, well, the peer review will tell you really what they think. Conferences, we have those too. So actually there are a lot of things about academia here that are captured very well, about the pursuit of knowledge, which is both a common a common endeavor, we're working together, but you don't mind if your name is on top of the paper before that of someone else. I really like that. It's, we're working together because well, the knowledge of the world will be increased, but I also want to be the one that, that does it. However, you don't have any sort of negative interaction, so it's not like you're going to backstab your lab assistant or stuff like that. So it's an honest, friendly race to uh, pursue knowledge that is not against your personal interest as an individual. So I like the general philosophical almost frame that you have here. Um, as for the flow and the pace of the game, as for the game mechanically, it is very solid. It is a puzzle. Uh, again, it's not multiplayer solo because you share information. You can't really again attack or, or get in the way of anybody, but you're just hoping that you do that better than somebody else. You find something before other people do. So you have that competition, you have that parallel race for the same objectives that make things more tense than if you're playing just a game solitaire without again making the game feel antagonistic. If anything, I think I like the Sighter version more if there were specific rules about uh, about adjudicating, about evaluating your performance. I didn't see any in the rule book. Did I miss them? Maybe. Uh, maybe there is something online, but say if you resolve, uh, if you find Planet X in a certain number of moves, this is how well you did, etc, etc, etc. There isn't really anything about that, and so you plant it, you find it, but that feels a little bit anticlimactic. Another small detail here, uh, the game, uh, and just because the game feels so scientifically accurate, I want to point this out, that the game uses the word theory in the sense that sometimes, often unfortunately, is used in common parlance as opposed to the technical term. In the science, oh, when we talk about theories in real life, many of us use theory as if that was a synonym for hypothesis or mere hunch. Uh, in the scientists, sciences is the exact opposite. The word theory is actually an hypothesis that has been demonstrated to be accurate by a number of scientists working independently over a period of time. An hypothesis, hypothesis graduates to become a theory and simply means that 
passed the hardest test that the sciences have devised. That's why the theory of evolution, the theory of gravitation, those are the opposite of hypothesis. So it was strange to me that it says you submit theories to journals. So those things, those tokens, they're called theory. So for a game that prides itself for a strong um, scientific background, that was a strange thing. No big deal. When I taught it to my daughters, I always thought about you submit hypothesis, and my daughters think that that is the technical term that the game uses, and it's fine. After I almost say, if I had to go to that little teeny tiny detail, is because to show that I. I uh, played the game and I, I paid attention to what I was doing and because the big things, the medium things and the small things are solid and then I go to the little teeny tiny details because the game is solid, it has such replay value because each puzzle will feel different uh, it's amazing to me that we have a game that you can play at the expert level or the youth level at the same time because again that scales the, the challenge so well. And so we had games in which my daughters did beat me quite uh, brutally, and yet it felt uh, totally fair. I didn't have to play in any way to help them win because they just started with a lot more clues than me, and that uh, presented them with a challenge that was tough, but appropriate at the appropriate level. So much fun. This is a fun game. It feels very fresh, very original. At the beginning, uh, when I was reading the rule book, I thought it would just feel like cold and dry and silent uh, and unforgiving, like outer space itself. It turned out actually to just be very engaging, very warm in a sense, very intellectually fascinating. Again, I was afraid it was just going to be, I don't know, like mastermind uh, in a disguised as something else, but it has its own flavor because the puzzles have a spatial element, uh, then the puzzles work differently every time. If you if you love puzzles, if you like logical puzzles, so then this is a game that I think you will enjoy very well. If you like games that are competitive, but they don't feel um, antagonistic, this also works well. I love it. I really, really love it, and so do my daughters. Uh, Probably before the day is over, we're going to play one more time because this game, these days we play even more games that we played recently, that we played before, uh, because of the days of social distancing and uh, let's call it the extended staycation that we're having and we're all having or we should all be having. And so it's a game that you can play with your family, you can play solitaire, although it's not as exciting. I guess it can work if you're playing also on remotely, on Zoom, Skype, or in any case on FaceTime, whatever. Um, as long as one player has a copy and the player is moving things and the players on the other side of the planet are making notes of the hypothesis that they submit to the journals. That's the only thing that I think would not translate very well. Otherwise, if you have your own app, you can be wherever and you can still play. In any case, the search for Planet X, I really, really enjoyed it, and so did my daughters. I'm going to give a high recommendation for this one because, well, it's a lot of fun.